In 1972, NASA starts work on a radical new reusable spacecraft. Its innovative design pushes engineering to the limit. They had to be light, they had to be reusable, they had to be very powerful. The space shuttle challenges engineers to create a vehicle that must withstand the explosive rigors of launch. Just that main engine, to get that to work is mind-boggling. Just as incredible, the incinerating temperatures of re-entry. You're like in the middle of a blowtorch. Not once, but time and time again. A lot of sleepless nights over there. Against all odds, engineers must strive to make spaceflight routine. Flying in space is tough and it's dangerous. This is the remarkable story of the unsung heroes who designed, built, and flew the space shuttle. April the 12th, 1981, the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Astronauts John Young and Bob Crippen are about to risk their lives in a vehicle that's never flown before. Space Shuttle Columbia. It was a test flight. We didn't know exactly what it was going to do. Go on for main engine start. The shuttle's three main engines roar into life, followed by two giant solid rocket boosters. And the shuttle leaps from the pad. And that's when my heart rate went up to about 130 beats per minute. As Columbia thunders skywards, it's the moment thousands of engineers have dedicated their lives to. The launch of the first ever reusable spacecraft. The space shuttle is an engineering marvel. For 30 years, it was the workhorse of America's space program, responsible for some of its most memorable achievements. And we're separating at about one foot per second. Launching satellites. Satellite uh, away. Delivering and servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. And assembling humanity's largest permanent outpost in space the International Space Station. The shuttle's unrivaled array of space firsts rests within an extraordinary feature and an incredible engineering challenge. The ability to fly in space time and time again. For years, the idea of a reusable spacecraft is the dream of early space pioneers. The capability to launch, maneuver in orbit, and then maneuver inside the atmosphere so that a landing can be made at will. If you go back and you look at the old science fiction films of the 50s, spaceships were reusable. It was accepted. And that dream was very much alive in the minds of the engineers at NASA. By the end of the 1960s, NASA has put men on the moon, but it's come at a vast cost. Each multi-million dollar moon rocket is discarded after launch. In the case of the uh, rocket engines and the rocket vehicles, they didn't come back. They were throwaways. They burned up in the atmosphere and those vehicles were expensive. With budgets for space exploration falling, NASA must find a new solution. One which promises to make spaceflight routine and ultimately cheaper. So you're saying to the engineers, you have a chance to build the world's first reusable spaceship, and it's gonna be amazing. It's a hugely ambitious project and NASA must persuade the US government to fund it. That means recruiting a powerful ally with a vested interest in space. 
the US Department of Defense. An eye in orbit is the perfect place to keep watch on America's enemies. NASA understood that in order to get the shuttle approved, they had to make the shuttle attractive to the Department of Defense. Seeing the shuttle's potential, the DOD agrees to join forces with NASA, but not without two important stipulations. First, the shuttle must be able to return to a specific landing site after just one orbit. The DOD guys say, launch, take classified reconnaissance photos, and come back down at the end of one orbit and land back at the launch site. The problem is that while you're doing that one orbit, in that 90 minutes, the Earth is turning underneath you. Meaning the shuttle's launch site shifts over 1,600 kilometers eastward. That means that you've got to launch it like a rocket and land it like an airplane, where you can steer to the proper landing point. Such versatility is something that's never been attempted before with a spacecraft but is critical in making it reusable. Aerospace engineer Tom Moser is tasked with the engineering challenge. As the requirements evolved, we knew we had to have a delta wing like some of the fighter jets. A delta wing will give the shuttle more controllability when returning to Earth. At the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, it's possible to see this distinctive shape with Space Shuttle Discovery. The Delta Wing gave this vehicle maneuverability to move to the left, move to the right, and it also gave it maneuverability during re-entry to make, make these big sweeping S turns as it was descending to bring this vehicle home. The wings are doing all the work. The shuttle's Delta Wing design promises the flying versatility the military requires. But NASA must also fulfill the second major requirement from the Department of Defense, launching large spy satellites. We had to carry a very large payload that weighed like 65,000 pounds, and 15 feet in diameter and 60 feet long. The strict military requirements dictate the design and shape of the spacecraft, called the orbiter. To launch it, engineers must build three revolutionary rocket engines, fueled by a giant external tank, along with two solid rocket boosters, giant reusable rockets, and then combine them to provide the immense thrust needed to lift the heavy payloads into orbit. So it was huge. The DOD requirements were a big driver, huge driver, in the design of the shuttle. The military's demands create a huge engineering challenge. But having them on board ticks the boxes on Capitol Hill. And in January 1972, President Nixon greenlights funding for the shuttle program. But this was a new idea, and it was one thing to say it, and it's another thing to actually do it. Now, NASA and the engineers it will employ face the enormity of constructing one of the most complex machines ever built. California, 1972. With the space shuttle's design determined, engineers at Rocketdyne begin work on a critical element of getting the orbiter into space its three main engines. Fresh out of college, Dan Hausman is challenged to help create a revolutionary rocket engine. I was very exciting because it was a brand new engine program and we called it the white truck to space. Once a week, we would take the space shuttle to orbit and life would be good. That's really not how it ended up. It was a big challenge to get that system to work. The Space Shuttle main engines will be the most sophisticated ever built. And most importantly, reliable enough to be used time and time again 
a demand that's never been made of a rocket engine before. They had to be light, they had to be reusable, uh, and they had to be very powerful. Uh, all those factors combined to make a extreme engineering challenge. Rocket engines produce thrust by burning propellants. Simply put, the more propellant burned each second, the more powerful the rocket. To increase the flow of propellant, rockets use a spinning pump, called a turbo pump, to increase the fuel pressure, ultimately increasing thrust. To lift heavy payloads, the shuttle's engines must deliver well over four million newtons of thrust, a staggering amount. Think of the engineering that is required to make that system alone work. Forget about everything else that's on the vehicle, just that main engine. To get that to work is mind-boggling. Dan Hausman and his colleagues know it requires a quantum leap in turbo pump technology. Engineering one with a phenomenal spin rate of up to 600 revolutions every second. Your car engine runs at 3,000 RPM. The high pressure fuel turbo pump ran at 33,000 RPM. And the balance of that has to be perfect. But Dan's team have an engineering solution. Place a small rocket inside the main engine and use its powerful exhaust to rapidly spin the turbo pumps. It's called a pre-burner. It looks good on paper. But on the test stand, the engines catastrophically fail in a fraction of a second. Those initial tests, uh, they engines came apart quite often, which is not a, a pretty thing to watch, <laughs> especially if you plan on using that to go fly. The problem is a balancing act. If the pre-burner spins the pumps too slowly, the engines won't get enough fuel. Too fast, and the pumps spin to destruction. It just has to be perfect, a jewel watch. If it's not, it'll come apart. And that's where the issues were, is in turbo pumps. And that's why the turbo pumps got redesigned a number of times. Calculating something as complex as the performance of a rocket engine is a breeze with today's computing power. But with the limiting technology of the 1970s, it's a painfully slow process. But all of our engineering was done on slide rules. Uh, there was no such thing as computers. We calculated that all by hand. Dan's team persist, precisely fine-tuning the turbo pumps, allowing each rocket engine to fire without a hitch. <laughs> and when those three engines actually all lit and behaved nicely, we all said, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> Getting astronauts into orbit requires a remarkable feat of engineering. But getting them safely back is an even greater challenge. Yeah, you gotta have a lot of power to get a spaceship into orbit. But the tricky part turns out to be getting it back through the atmosphere in that process that we call re-entry. To orbit Earth, requires a speed of around 28,000 kilometers an hour. But landing a shuttle safely means shedding almost all of that energy to touch down at around 320 kilometers an hour. As astronaut Story Musgrave can testify, this huge deceleration creates a fiery problem. It's just outrageous. You think you should evaporate in a second you are engulfed. You're like in the middle of a blowtorch. Early astronauts return in capsules with heat shields designed to survive only one blistering re-entry.
that the space shuttle must fly multiple missions, which produces a critical engineering problem. How do you create a heat shield that can withstand that searing heat and be unscathed so that you can use it again? For the engineers, this forces a radical rethink. The Holy Grail is a material that can withstand temperatures of almost 1,300 degrees Celsius. Eventually, engineers discover a breakthrough. In the 1960s, Lockheed, working with the help of NASA, came up with a new technology, and that new technology was made out of silica, just like beach sand. It's discovered that silica can be used to create a hard, lightweight ceramic with amazing thermal properties. Providing an extremely good barrier against heat, as thermal protection systems engineer Martin Wilson demonstrates. If you heat it up, it tends to cool off very, very rapidly. So you can hit it with a lot of heat. It's very hot very quickly, but it also sheds heat very, very rapidly also. And the back's just cold to the touch. Silica ceramics fit the bill as a reusable heat shield. But the engineers aren't out of the woods yet. Now, they must find a way of covering the shuttle's aluminium airframe. But it's much larger and more complex than conical re-entry capsules. Engineers plan to clad it with thousands of custom-made tiles. The tiles were essentially all different. Every one had to be manufactured specifically for a particular spot on the vehicle. It's a painstaking task. Over 33,000 tiles must be cut, fired, and precisely glued. But in March 1979, with its maiden flight just one year away, orbital assembler Rockwell International are falling behind schedule. They transport the orbiter from their plant in California to Florida, where the remaining tiles will be attached. But the trip reveals a design flaw, which requires a radical rethink if the shuttle is to make it into space. When Columbia arrives at the Kennedy Space Center, on the back of a specially modified 747 jumbo jet, engineers like Bob Seek can hardly believe their eyes. It didn't look as nice as the advertising brochure would have <laughs> it indicated. And there was lots of exposed skin. Thousands of tiles are missing. Many have fallen off in transit. It's a shocking realization. The tiles didn't have sufficient strength to stay on. It means we can't fly, pure and simple. Could not fly. So suddenly the engineers had to stop and say, oh my god, how are we going to prevent this from happening to a shuttle in flight? The shuttle is grounded. NASA scrambles to understand why so many tiles have fallen off. The answer lies with something as small as stitching. The shuttle is designed to flex during the stresses and strains of flight. But attaching tiles to a flexing airframe is a recipe for disaster. So the tiles are glued onto stitched felt pads that absorb the forces, keeping the tiles from cracking. Tiles are very rigid and very fragile. So the pad allows the tile to move relative to the aluminum. But on inspection, a startling discovery is made. The orientation of stitching within the felt pads means that instead of absorbing the forces of flexing, the pads are amplifying them. That's why so many tiles were lost in transit. For the engineers, the fix is a daunting realization. So we had to make the tiles stronger. That kept us awake at night. A lot of sleepless nights over that. Engineers experiment 
with how to strengthen the tiles so they'll remain attached to the felt pads. Their breakthrough is painting the bottom with a mix of silica, water and ammonia and then baking them. The solution soaks into the tiles, adding extra silica which sets hard when heated. It's a process called densification. So it doubled the strength of the tile and essentially did not increase the weight a bit. Did not change the thermal performance. It was a miracle. Well, it was not a miracle, but it was good engineering. It might be good engineering, but the implications are massive. Thousands of tiles must be stripped from Columbia and strengthened. Then we had to take them off the vehicle, densify them, and put them back on the vehicle. Desperate to have the shuttle ready for launch, NASA must expand its tile workforce from 200 to 3,000. Now you have to call in an army of technicians, like a, a mobilization in, in wartime that's got to happen for just this one problem. It was a schedule nightmare, and we literally counted tiles. How many did we put on? How many did we take off? How many did we have left to go? More than a year is spent working round the clock to complete Columbia's thermal protection system. The astronauts know their lives depend on the quality of this work. John Young and I spent a lot of time with the, the people that were doing the tile work, telling them how much we appreciated the effort they were going through, how important it was. It was your body that was going to be strapped into that thing, and you wanted to make sure it would work. Fixing Columbia's heat shield ranks as one of the crowning engineering achievements responsible for certifying the space shuttle ready to fly. April the 12th, 1981. Columbia finally stands poised for its first test flight. Preparing to board are Commander John Young and pilot Bob Crippen. Flying in space is tough and it's dangerous. It was a test flight. We didn't know exactly what it was going to do. Chief Shuttle Engineer Bob Seek is in the firing room. There, there was tension, apprehension, but on the other hand, there was confidence that, hey, done the best we can. The anxiety was high, extremely high, because we had uh, two, of our, two of our colleagues on board. T-minus 10, 9. The astronauts ready themselves for the flight of a lifetime. I turned to John and I said, I think we might do it. Six. At T minus six seconds, the shuttle's fuel pumps spin into life as the engines ignite. We've gone for main engine start. That's when my heart rate went up to about 130 beats per minute. <laughs> I was pretty excited. It was like something being born. It's saying, look, I'm ready to go. Finally, as the shuttle's two solid rocket boosters ignite, Columbia surges from the pad. I mean, you get up and move, you clear the tower in a couple of seconds. The engineers in the firing room can hardly contain their excitement. There's this initial shout of joy from the control room, big roar. And then we all remembered our discipline and there was immediate quiet. After a bone jarring two minutes, the mighty solid rocket boosters are spent. We see SRB set flight. Roger on a set. Another big roar. And then another, oops, remember our discipline, quiet. Negative seats, Columbia, your negative seats. At that point, it gets really quiet. You're not shaking anymore. It's about as calm as me sitting here in this chair. Finally, eight and a half minutes after launch, Columbia's three main engines shut down, having performed 
perfectly. <laughs> Euphoria reigned. High fives, hugs, handshakes, tears, flag waving. There probably wasn't a dry eye in firing room two. I mean, it was just an emotional experience. After almost a decade of engineering toil, Space Shuttle Columbia arrives in orbit. Engineers and astronauts are ecstatic, but it's short-lived. As the astronauts open the shuttle's payload bay doors, they're greeted by an alarming sight. Missing protective tiles, which could spell disaster for their safe return to Earth. When I opened up the payload bay doors, I saw that we had some tiles missing. It did cause a lot of consternation on the grounds. We have a, uh, a few tiles missing. Roger, Grip, we can see that good. Unmistakable black patches reveal where tiles from the spacecraft's heat shield have torn off. Luckily, they're missing from a non-critical area on the top side of the vehicle. Now, that part of the shuttle is not a real cause for concern because it does not experience the really intense heating during re-entry. But what no one knows is, are we also missing tiles underneath the shuttle where a missing tile could be catastrophic? During re-entry, Columbia's underside will experience searing temperatures of almost 1,300 degrees Celsius. Tiles lost from here pose a significant threat to the astronauts' survival. If a tile was missing, there was no way to repair it, there was nothing to do. The fate of Columbia's astronauts will only become clear when they re-enter the atmosphere. April the 14th, 1981. After a near textbook two days in orbit, Columbia begins the final critical part of its maiden flight. Slamming into the atmosphere at over 27,000 kilometers an hour as it returns to Earth. It's about Mach 25 when you hit the Earth's atmosphere at around 400,000 feet. As Columbia begins to experience the blazing heat of re-entry, all thoughts are on the orbiter's thermal protection system. That was a scary moment. You know, who knew if this thing was actually surviving re-entry? Didn't know if it would burn through or what. Enveloped in a searing shroud of plasma, radio communications with Columbia are lost for a nail-biting 16 minutes. Here. How do you read? But right on schedule, communications are restored. And the relief in mission control is palpable. It was only when that call came through that everybody could breathe a sigh of relief. Columbia's heat shield survives re-entry. And escorted by two chase planes, the orbiter glides towards a landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California's Mojave Desert. No rattling or shaking, just as smooth as can be, but like you coming in a commercial airliner somewhere. It was a, a moment. Wow, this thing works. <laughs> it's great. It's a super machine. For the first time in history, a spacecraft has been launched as a rocket and returned as a glider a reusable vehicle ready to fly in space again. The success of Columbia paves the way for a new era in spaceflight. NASA rolls out three more orbiters, Challenger, Discovery and Atlantis. Deftly demonstrating the shuttle's ability to carry a wealth of scientific experiments, satellites, and commercial payloads into orbit.
Here comes the shoot. Yeah. Back shoot. For a while, it seems space flight has become almost routine. That's four minutes right, and counting. Back. Copy that, thank you. January the 28th, 1986. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger, roll, Challenger. Challenger. God, no. A minute, 15 seconds. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. Immediately, we know there's been a tragedy. We know that seven lives, you know, have been lost. Just 73 seconds after launch, Space Shuttle Challenger disintegrates in a devastating fireball. You can't help but think, what happened? What did we do? What did we not do? What step did we miss in a procedure? Immediately after the disaster, many engineers suspect the failure lies with one of the shuttle's most complex components, its main engines. But engineer Dan Hausman knows it's too early to jump to conclusions. We were told it was an engine failure. Then I said, that could have been. Don't know, we, until we look at the data, we, are not, we don't know. Hausman and his colleagues meticulously pore over every millisecond of data returned from each engine. Now, those engines, they were working just like they were supposed to leading them to a more surprising conclusion. I quickly realized that it was an SRB issue. The two solid rocket boosters, SRBs for short, help lift the shuttle off the pad. Firing for just over two minutes, they're the largest of their type ever built. They draw on tried and tested technology, and compared to the main engines, their design is relatively simple. I never considered uh, that the booster would ever cause us a problem because the booster really had uh, no moving parts. But analyzing film footage of Challenger's launch suggests otherwise. First indication you got was a film of the uh, launch. You see a puff of smoke when we ignite the boosters. The footage provides investigators with a vital clue. Hardware talks to you. It was trying to tell us we had a bad joint design from the very beginning. The solid rocket boosters are stacked from a number of segments joined together. Inside each joint are flexible rubber bands called O-rings. On ignition, pressure inside pushes on the flexible rubber O-rings, forcing them to seal each joint. But the black smoke caught on camera suggests an O-ring seal has failed. Engineers need to understand why a catastrophic failure occurs during this launch compared to the previous 24 successful launches. The team redoubles their efforts. On the morning that we actually launched Challenger, it was cold. If you go look, it was, there was ice on the pad. The night before launch, temperatures plummet to around minus five degrees Celsius almost unheard of in Florida. Investigations discover that at these freezing temperatures, the rubber-like O-rings become brittle and fail to seal the solid rocket booster joints as designed. This leads to the devastating chain of events with Challenger. So what you actually have is something that looks like a blowtorch. You got 6,000 degree gas going over uh, both O-rings and out into the environment. A little over a minute after launch, searing exhaust from the breached O-ring burns through the SRB's lower strut, causing it to pivot into the giant external fuel tank, which ruptures, cascading tens of thousands of liters of fuel 
into white-hot exhaust. It was certainly not a day we should have gone flying. The loss of Challenger is a huge blow for NASA and the engineers. After Challenger, there's a lot of us wanting to quit. We didn't want to be part of a program that cost people their lives. We didn't want to be a part of that. And so they brought people in to talk to us and say, you know, we need you guys to help work so that doesn't happen again. And so some people quit. You know, they just couldn't handle that. And so the rest of us just worked very hard to make sure it wouldn't happen again. Engineers redesigned the SRB joints and O-rings, adding triple redundancy with heaters that will keep them at a constant temperature. Some people thought that was a belt and suspenders, but it made me feel a lot better uh, uh, to go fly. September the 29th, 1988. After a comprehensive engineering review and with hundreds of safety modifications, Space Shuttle Discovery heralds a return to flight of America's manned space program. The next 15 years sees the shuttle once again prove itself as an engineering marvel. But its sheer complexity means the odds are stacked against it. February the 1st, 2003. After 16 days in orbit, Columbia and its crew are on their way home, blazing through the atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound. Then, just 15 minutes from landing, COG in it. Mission Control are unable to establish on, radio man. contact. Unknown to them, Space Shuttle Columbia has disintegrated in the skies above Texas. Columbia Houston, UHF com check. Eventually, NASA's worst fears are realized. The loss of the orbiter and another seven astronauts. For NASA, losing a second shuttle is devastating. But the most likely cause makes it even more unbelievable. Okay, everybody. No data, no phone calls, no transmissions anywhere off-site. Film footage reviewed after launch reveals a piece of foam insulation falling from the external fuel tank. It strikes the leading edge of Columbia's wing. This is the leading edge of the Delta wing. It's made of a reinforced carbon carbon, and it's actually a cap that fits over the edge of the wing. It takes the highest heat of all during re-entry. It's during re-entry that Columbia is lost suggesting its protective heat shield of reinforced carbon-carbon, or RCC, may have been breached. We really didn't think something that was as light as a feather could break something as tough as RCC in half. But as engineers begin their investigations, the truth behind Columbia's disintegration will become tragically clear. Space Shuttle Columbia's destruction leaves engineers dumbfounded. How could a seemingly harmless piece of foam smash a hole in the orbiter's critical heat shield? Ballistics expert Matt Mellis is one of the engineers tasked with finding out. We got a phone call from one of the folks at Johnson Space Center. They said, um, we think that this is an impact problem and we think we're going to need your help. What they find is disturbing. So this is a little piece of foam. It weighs two grams. This is an example of the test specimens that we shot. It weighs what a sheet of paper weighs. The reinforced carbon per carbon, and this is a test sample of that. This is what the leading edges of the wings are made out of. Our test showed that if going fast enough, 500 miles an hour, which is not that fast in aerospace terms, this little piece of foam it can cause critical damage to this material, which is tough as nails. So it's an amazing lesson that we learned from that. The team examines the launch footage to determine exactly where the foam struck. 
they narrow it down to a specific area between carbon panel six and nine of Columbia's left wing. Building a replica, they focus on this part of the leading edge. Using a powerful air gun, they first fire foam at panel six. It remains intact, leaving the engineers puzzled, but a vital clue helps their next test. In the search for debris, investigators find fragments of Columbia's leading edge panels belonging to the wing that was struck. They began to piece these tiles together and these fragments of the leading edge together. They showed molten material in the area of panel eight. Most metals melt at extremely high temperatures, the kind experienced during re-entry. Discovering so much melted metal around panel eight is the breakthrough the engineers need. That really provided supporting evidence that this foam strike took place in the region of panel eight. The final piece of evidence comes from the foam firing tests. Engineers now focus on panel eight. And the results are shocking. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. A piece of foam ultimately caused the loss of a vehicle and the loss of seven lives. Engineers learn from the tragic lessons. But with the loss of two orbiters and 14 astronauts, the shuttle program's days are numbered. The Columbia accident, like the Challenger accident before it, was a very painful reminder that there was nothing routine about flying the space shuttle. July the 8th, 2011. Space Shuttle Atlantis lifts off on the program's final flight. Over three decades, 135 shuttle missions chalk up a combined three and a half years in orbit. Carrying 355 individual astronauts from 16 different countries. And delivering over one and a half thousand tons of payload. But ultimately, the shuttle's complexity means the running costs and risks are too high to continue flying. Today, the shuttles reside in the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum and other exhibits around America. An inspiration to all who come to see them. You can't fly a vehicle like this and not appreciate the handiwork of everyone that was involved in it. The accolades that those people deserve, it's just an absolutely incredible, amazing feat. They did what it took to keep this remarkable flying machine in service as the icon of America's aspirations in space. The shuttle's work is now complete. But its engineering legacy will outlast those who built it. Of all things with wings, the shuttle has to be the most magnificent flying machine of all. In the mid-60s, a small group of NASA engineers start work on a radical idea. To establish a permanent human presence in the lethal environment of space. We were doing something that man had never done before. A facility that has to operate 24-7. A dream that will become the most expensive structure ever built, costing $100 billion. That's a view you don't see every day. The International Space Station. But to achieve this goal, America must change the course of history. Houston flight to Moscow. And work with a former enemy. The Russians were there with their space station, and we were not. Engineers must overcome seemingly impossible odds. Let's go, let's go. It was very intense, 
Adrenaline was running very high. We had a spacecraft up there. We weren't going to give up on it. And it was a perfect example of ingenuity in the moment. This is the story of the unsung heroes who built the International Space Station. August 2016. Over 400 kilometers above the Earth, NASA astronauts Jeff Williams and Kate Rubens are undertaking a critical spacewalk. Okay, I'm an egress now, and then make these cables in the egress position. That sounds great, Jeff. Thanks. They must fit a docking adapter that will allow both manned and unmanned spacecraft from different countries to visit the International Space Station. Covers loose. Okay, I will meet you at the back. It will be the latest addition to an outpost in space that has been permanently occupied for 16 years. A 420-ton engineering marvel the size of a football field. Traveling at almost 30,000 kilometers per hour, it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. Anyone here on Earth can look up at an appointed moment and see the International Space Station orbiting overhead. And that is a great testimony to the engineering prowess that went into it. 217 astronauts from 15 countries have lived on board. Many of them gazing back at the Earth from the extraordinary glass cupola. I'm awed by the fact that we've had crews in orbit for all these years. The term space station dates back to the 1920s. But its Second World War rocket pioneer Werner von Braun, who was among those imagining an orbiting space station. Von Braun heads up a group of German rocket engineers brought to the US after World War II to work on America's early space program. Dr. Von Braun had the vision and the dream, even in the very earliest days of uh, human spaceflight. In 1952, he declares, Development of the space station is as inevitable as the rising sun. Von Braun envisages a huge wheel over 70 meters wide, rotating slowly as it orbits the Earth. It's a vision that would be borrowed by movie maker Stanley Kubrick for his sci-fi classic, 2001, A Space Odyssey. By the mid-60s, NASA is consumed with creating the rocket that will take men to the moon. Building a space station isn't a priority. But at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama, engineers including George Hardy and Jim Splorn are looking beyond the space race and making new plans. Apollo, we learned to go to a destination in space and return. Now we wanted to learn about living in space and living for extended periods of time. But the Apollo missions have been hugely expensive. And from 1966, NASA's budget is cut by 44%. Engineers are forced to use their ingenuity to design a space station on the cheap. We just kept working on it until something came up that we could say, yeah, we think we're going to go do this, and it'd probably work. That groundbreaking idea is to transform the top section of a Saturn V rocket into a space station. Engineers take their proposal, named Skylab, to NASA, who give it the green light. But now, 
they face uncharted territory. Skylight gave you an opportunity to have a shirt sleeve environment to run experiments over a long period of time, see how well men can survive in space. They weren't too sure what the long-term effects would be until you experimented and found out. First, they must bolt together their space station using the third stage of the Saturn V rocket. A telescope is attached to the old hydrogen storage tank, which is stripped out so humans can live inside. To make living in space more bearable, it will have a few home comforts, like a kitchen and a shower, along with a laboratory and life support systems. Two massive solar panel arrays will provide power. The mood around the engineering staffs was pure excitement. This full-size backup at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum is testament to the engineers' incredible ingenuity. But they now face the challenge of keeping a spacecraft in orbit for up to a decade. Here you have a facility that has to operate 24-7. The maintainability and operability was the real challenge. We had never done that. To maintain Skylab, astronauts will be required to undertake longer spacewalks than ever before. This had never been pushed to the extreme of being able to stay out over just a very short period of time, like an hour or two. To test those extremes, engineers must first replicate zero gravity conditions on Earth. A small pit at Alabama's Marshall Space Flight Center is filled with water to try and simulate weightlessness. One of the first things that we had to figure out is how can we compensate the flotation of a man in a pressure suit once he goes underwater. We decided that we can make a harness of lead weights to put on him. The weight counterbalances the volume of air around the body inside the pressure suit. It works. Engineers make a man in a pressure suit neutrally buoyant underwater, neither rising nor sinking. We decided that we should invite top management to watch a test, go to the very top guy, and that was Dr. Werner von Braun. When he saw what we were doing, he said, yeah, yeah, he's good, he's good, keep going, keep going. Von Braun gives the go-ahead to upscale the experiment into a million-dollar project. 23 meters in diameter, 12 meters deep, and holding almost 6 million liters. It's officially called the Neutral Buoyancy Simulator. But it's nicknamed the Big Tank. Why such a big tank? We had fabricated a full-scale mock-up of Skylab. We could get all of the ingredients there that we needed to have for the training of the flight crew. Marshall's neutral buoyancy simulator is a vital part of training astronauts to do DIY repairs on Skylab in zero gravity. But nobody could have imagined just how critical it would become. May the 14th, 1973. The countdown approaches for America's first space station, Skylab, packed into the top section of a Saturn V rocket. It's the first step to the ultimate goal of a permanent human presence in the most hostile environment known to man. Ignition sequence has started. Five, four, three. But just 63 seconds after launch, 
Skylab is in trouble. We started seeing telemetry that there'd been a, a failure. As the rocket cleared the tower and went up into the clouds, suddenly aerodynamic forces grabbed a piece of this micrometeoroid shield that protected the actual lab itself. We had a big problem. The micrometeoroid shield is mission critical as it wraps around Skylab's heart, its laboratory and crew quarters. Made from aluminium, it's primarily designed to protect astronauts from the impact of cosmic debris. There was an, enough air trapped under it that it expanded. The vibration of the dynamic pressure grabbed a hold of the top edge and ripped it off. It was like peeling an orange. It was bleak. I felt the mission was lost. The shield also performs a second critical function, doubling up as a sunshade. Exposed to the sun in space, blistering temperatures will soon make Skylab uninhabitable, destroying the mission. As soon as we got on orbit, the temperature started going up. The temperature has got to 125, maybe 130 degrees. All the environmental control system, the life support system, the food, the electronics, communication systems, breathing systems. Sooner rather than later, they needed to get some way to control the thermal conditions on the vehicle or they would be lost in a number of days for human habitation. The engineers are now in a race against time. Meanwhile, the crew, who were scheduled to launch the following day, are grounded. Tom Moser is part of the team scramble to save the roasting space station. We devised a parasol that could be unfurled, just like an umbrella. The parasol will shield Skylab from the sun's extreme heat. But engineers must create it from scratch. Designing the parasol to operate in zero gravity was a tricky operation. We could calculate some of the effects that it would have, but we haven't got the time that you would normally have when you're designing space hardware. The team decides to use the same material that protects astronauts from the heat of the sun. But it's useless unless they figure out how to make a supporting structure. It was like, what in the world do we have in our garages? Or what can we go to the store and buy that might help us do this? Then inspiration strikes. One of the engineers thinks fishing rods might work. The plan is to fasten four of them together to create the engineering prototype. We needed a quick answer, and I did think it was rather ingenious. Fortunately, there's a tiny airlock right next to where the micrometeoroid shield would have been. The idea is for an astronaut to manually push the parasol outside through this airlock. Four spring-loaded arms will then be extended to deploy the makeshift fabric sunshield, measuring approximately seven meters by seven meters. An inspired solution, if it works. There was a huge time pressure to get that system designed and built and, uh, and put up there. The engineers managed to finish the parasol in just 10 days. It was very intense. Adrenaline was running very high. Even though there was risk, if there was a chance that this would work, it needed to be tried. May the 25th, 1973. The Skylab crew prepares for their delayed mission, which is now a daunting rescue operation. No one, least of all astronauts Pete Conrad, Joe Kerwin and Paul Weitz, has any idea just how bad the damage to Skylab is. Or if they can save it. Your adrenaline is up. Your expectations are high. You really couldn't assess all the damage until you got there. There was an urgency. In it.
certain degree of apprehension what's going to happen next. Roger, Pete, copy. Closing in on the overheating space station, Pete Conrad reports the damage to the two main solar panels back to mission control. His brief description is his suspected solar wing two right. is gone, completely off the bird. Roger, copy. The solar array, one of them is completely ripped off with trailing its little wires. The other one is held down, kind of pinioned by one of the straps of what's left of the micrometeoroid shield. These images reveal the sun-blistered surface, exposed where the micrometeoroid shield peeled off. As the astronauts dock, they're faced with an unprecedented challenge. They must enter a spacecraft cooking at over 50 degrees Celsius to deploy an untried device in zero gravity. Failure will mean the loss of America's first space station. It's the moment of truth for the fishing rod-inspired parasol. So we are progressing slow but sure, and everything so far is working. Engineering and flight teams in mission control hold their breath. The makeshift parasol deploys without a problem. We can see the ends of all the rods. It's completely free of anything. There's nothing hanging it up. As the crew got the parasol out, it was jubilation. But the celebrations are short-lived. The station's survival also depends on deploying the one remaining solar panel. The solar panels for the Skylab is the way that they have enough power to do any of the experiments, to keep everything working, to keep it cool. How they generate power for all of the equipment. Pete Conrad and Joe Kerwin now face an extraordinarily demanding repair job a critical spacewalk to free the stuck solar panel. The only way to do that was to have two of the crew go out and do a spacewalk. Reach down to the base of where that strap is holding on to the solar array, cut it, and then pull the solar array out. It's at this moment that Jim Splorn's big tank at Marshall comes into its own. All the time that this was going on, we had air-to-ground communications. We were ready to help them in any way we could. In the water, a backup crew mirror the astronauts' every move. Bob Crippen was part of the Skylab support team. They had a device that was kind of like a long pole with a cutter on the end of it, like somebody might use to trim trees. But can a design based on a $65 tree pruner really save a $2.5 billion space station? America's dream of a long-term human presence in space is on a knife edge. If Pete Conrad and Joe Kerwin can't free Skylab's one remaining large solar panel, it won't have enough power to survive. Everything rests on a single spacewalk. Skylab, are you allowed to clear? OK, Houston, we're out there. There looks like enough room to get the cutter. So the solar array has been pinioned down by a small strap that's ripped off of the micrometeoroid shield. Joe Kerman was operating the device. He was able to get into position and work the cutter. Pete managed to put in an extra pressure on it. Let's go, let's go! He went flying away from the uh, spacecraft. 
The only thing preventing Pete Conrad spinning out into space is an 18-metre cord fixed to the airlock. He was constrained by the umbilical which held him in. You have to know Pete, uh, he was saying like, wahoo, or something like that when, when he went out flying. All right. That would have probably scared the dickens out of anybody else, but not Pete. Pete Conrad said, this is just like the water tank at Marshall, except it's a little bit deeper. So that was a good compliment. It's a good compliment. The recovery of that mission was a almost indescribable pride just to be a little part of it. Two more crews will visit Skylab to carry out scientific and medical experiments, including the effects of weightlessness. The last manned mission leaves Skylab in 1974. Five years later, it slowly re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, showering debris over the Australian outback. It was a bit of sadness, I suppose but a great sense of satisfaction on what had been accomplished. The legacy of Skylab's engineers is a stepping stone to meet the next epic challenge in space. In 1984, President Reagan gives a State of the Union address that echoes John F. Kennedy's historic moonshot goal. Tonight, I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. This orbiting space station will be named Freedom. Canada, Japan and the European Space Agency all sign up to the ambitious idea. The goal is to provide a laboratory in space to do science and engineering research, to advance exploration. The tragedy is just around the corner. Challenger, go and draw up. Challenger, go and draw up. As the world reels from the Challenger disaster, the American space program is put on hold. In contrast, their Cold War rivals are thriving. The Soviets have launched seven Salyut space stations. Having not landed on the moon, they focused their space program on to how to do these long missions in Earth orbit. Just two weeks after Challenger, the Soviets launched the first module of their new space station, called Mir. The Russians were there with their space station, and we were not. But in 1989, the beginning of the fall of communism tips the Soviet space program into financial and political turmoil. America isn't faring much better. Space Station Freedom is stuck at the design stage, thanks to holdups and budget cuts. NASA needs a radical rethink if they're to meet the goal of the president. In 1993, America does what for decades would have been unthinkable, asking its former Cold War enemy, Russia, to join forces on a newly named International Space Station, or ISS. Since the launch of the Mir, the Soviets had a near permanent human presence in orbit, and that taught them a great deal. It was a vast resource that I don't think the Americans could have shied away from. NASA are charged with designing the biggest ever structure to be assembled in space. Their solution is for a series of modular or segmented sections to be joined together. 
Rod Jones was a member of one of the ISS design teams. What we learned from looking at the mirror was that if you put modularity into your design, you can extend and perpetuate the vehicle life for a much longer period of time. The modularity, it allows you to add things to the space station, take things away. It allows you to shift functionality around the space station. But can these former enemies work together to create a new space station? June the 27th, 1995. Space Shuttle Atlantis lifts off to dock with Russian space station Mir. Capture confirmed. Capture is confirmed. Atlantis is now docked with the Russian space station. It's the first of nine missions that dock with Mir, allowing the two countries to pave the way for the International Space Station. Mir became a destination for studying the engineering, the science, and human factors in human spaceflight. With their old rivalry set aside, construction of the ISS modules gets underway. But their dream will be tested as both sides encounter a critical problem. The dawn of 1993. America's dream of a permanent human presence in space is under threat. With NASA strapped for cash, the only way of realizing their goal is to work with the Russians. But a major engineering challenge stands in the way. Because we wanted to get the Russians on board the International Space Station program, we had to get them launching from their own launch sites. And those are up at about 52 degrees latitude. The Russians launch all their rockets from Kazakhstan into a 52 degree orbital angle. And this is where the ISS will be assembled in space. But for the Americans, that presents a huge problem. The space shuttle usually launches from Cape Kennedy into a much lower orbital angle of around 30 degrees. The trouble is, to reach the greater 52 degree angle, the shuttle loses the boost it gets from the Earth's rotation that helps it into orbit. Bottom line, by carrying heavy ISS components, the shuttle doesn't have enough power to launch into the steeper angle. To fly at those higher inclinations and carry up large payloads, you need more power. Astronaut Mike Massimino is a veteran of two shuttle missions. To get to that higher inclination requires more power, which means more fuel, but you can't add endless fuel because you're constrained by the size of your tank. Engineers are forced to look at the only other option. Make the shuttle lighter. They calculate it needs to lose six tons to give it enough power to lift ISS components. They shave nearly half by redesigning the shuttle's storage racks and even the crew seats. But they still need to lose another 3,150 kilograms. Myron Pesson was chief engineer for the shuttle's external tank. The demands on us were extreme to, to get that 7,000 pounds. So engineers come up with a radical solution. Make a new external tank from a revolutionary metal alloy called Welderlite. These aluminum lithium alloys were higher strength and uh, lighter. But Welderlite is so new, it's barely beyond the development stage. The material properties were still somewhat uncertain, but we all felt it was an acceptable risk to go forward with this because of the national need for it. 
In February 1998, NASA takes delivery of the shuttle's new super lightweight external tank. Now, assembly of the largest and most expensive structure in space can begin. But to succeed, the 15 different ISS modules must be docked precisely 400 kilometers above the Earth. You had all these different pieces that needed to fit together in space. I thought to myself, there's no way that this stuff is all going to work. You know, you can't get things to fit together you know, in your kitchen. How are we going to get this to work in space with different countries and different languages and rocket ships and all this other stuff? How is it going to work? On November the 20th, the Russians take the first step. Lift off of the proton rocket of the Zarya control module. The International Space Station is underway. Zarya will provide the initial propulsion and power for the ISS, along with communication systems and docking ports for future modules. The pressure is now on the Americans. For the ISS to progress any further, the first US module, the Unity node, must be connected to Zarya in the lethal vacuum of space. December the 4th, 1998. Commander Robert Cabana and his crew prepare for an unprecedented mission. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour with the first American element of the International Space Station uniting our efforts in space. Two days later, they rendezvous with Zarya. Unload the Unity node and inch it towards the Russian module. Houston Endeavour, we have capture of Zarya. The first stage of the ISS is born. Engineers have enabled two former enemies to build a permanent structure in space. These two modules are the first of what will grow into an enormous 15-module space station. Seven modules are delivered from the US, five by Russia, two by Japan, and one from Europe. But there are limits to what you can cram into a space shuttle. Transporting this giant jigsaw into space will be an epic challenge. We made the modules as big as we could to fit them in the shuttle. The length of a module, it became like a bologna slice. How much can you afford to launch? And that's where you cut it off. It takes 13 years, 37 shuttle flights, 160 spacewalks, and over a thousand hours to construct the ISS in orbit. But building it is only half the battle. Allowing astronauts to be self-sufficient in space long term creates a new raft of engineering challenges. This oxygen generation system provides 56% of the crew's breathable atmosphere. It works by pulling oxygen molecules out of water. But that's a monumentally expensive commodity to haul up over 400 kilometers to the ISS. So this is almost a liter of water. And to get this into space, it's about 48,000 US dollars. As urine is 95% water, that makes astronaut P a precious commodity. Sure. Jennifer Pruitt is part of the engineering team who have found an ingenious way to recycle urine on the ISS. The overall goal is to take astronaut urine and pull the water out of it so we can have good clean water for the astronauts to drink and to use on the space station. On Earth, gravity makes extracting water from urine easy. 
just boil off impurities and catch the clean water as it cools. But the way water behaves in zero gravity makes distilling it much more difficult. One of the problems with trying to distill urine in space is that it's not going to have steam that rises like you would on Earth and be able to capture it. This ingenious urine distillation assembly recycles astronauts' waste by creating artificial gravity. This whole part is a centrifuge that'll spin. So the urine will be sprayed out along the back wall as it spins. The heavy, dense fluid will stick to the wall, and the lighter steam, as it evaporates out, will be sucked through the center, through that mesh, onto the next part of the system. So at the end, this is the good, clean urine distillate that you get. This is what will go on to the water processor assembly later on, and then will be the water that the astronauts will drink. Since its installation on the ISS in 2008, 85% of the water in urine has been recycled in this way. Just hours after peeing, an astronaut can be drinking fresh water. That's what's great about the space station. This is something that had never been done before. It is so important for long-term humans into space. Smart engineering like this has allowed the ISS to be permanently inhabited since the year 2000 by hundreds of astronauts. But lingering in orbit exposes space stations to a potentially catastrophic event, a high-speed impact. November 2016. The International Space Station celebrates 16 years of full-time habitation. Research carried out by ISS scientists is now helping to develop improved vaccines and advanced robotic surgical techniques for neurosurgeons on Earth. But this orbiting 420-ton structure is potentially at risk from a nightmare scenario. There are just a couple things that you're really worried about when you're in space. They're always kind of like, all uh, right, you know, they're kind of living on edge. One is a fire, and that would be bad. The other major problem is if you got hit, you would be in a life-threatening situation. More than 100 million fragments of debris orbit our planet, traveling up to almost 30,000 kilometers per hour. At those speeds, even the tiniest piece can do serious damage. A fleck of paint gouged this crater into the windshield of a space shuttle. Damage to the ISS is unavoidable. The International Space Station, it's getting hit. It's getting hit all the time. This is a major risk. The ISS is protected by a layer of shielding. The frame is made of two thin plates of aluminium. The outer bumper layer causes debris to fragment on impact. Inside are six layers of ceramic fiber and Kevlar fabric stuffing. An inner layer of aluminium catches what's left of the energy of the impact. It's a huge advance in shield design since the single layer of aluminium used to protect Skylab. At the NASA Johnson Space Center, Dana Lear is using a high-pressure gas gun to test fire a particle at a potential new layer. If successful, it could be a new first line of defense for the ISS. Okay. There's a small hole here in this outer layer we call the bumper shield. This is the first layer that's encountered by space debris. When it passes through that bumper, it actually tears the particle up. So let me take the outer bumper off. The second layer, it's not perforated, and you can see the particle has been broken up into small particulates. 
There are seven layers of this new material being tested. A metal alloy that's 90% iron. If we go down to the last layer, you can see that we haven't penetrated any further into the shield and certainly didn't penetrate down to the pressure wall. So this works really good. Like Werner von Braun 65 years ago, visionary engineers today see space stations as a stepping stone to explore distant worlds. We learned very valuable lessons putting together the space station. That's going to be invaluable experience of how to engineer a big project on a place like Mars. April the 8th, 2016. A SpaceX cargo rocket launches a revolutionary new piece of technology that could change the way we build space stations in the future. And space engineering, because you're limited by the amount of weight you can take with you, you need to miniaturize as much as possible. Good morning from Mission Control Houston. We bring you the installation of the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, referred to as BEAM. BEAM is a lightweight, flat-pack module, flown to the ISS in a small package, attached, and then expanded. Instead of heavy aluminium, BEAM is made from layers of insulating material covered with a silica fiber cloth. It also has an ingenious key feature. During the expansion, we had rip stitch straps that would essentially open up and allow the module to gradually expand. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. ISV success, DC complete. Houston copies. If successful, BEAM will undergo a two-year trial on board the ISS. This is a stepping stone to see humans on Mars uh, eventually. The soaring achievement of the ISS owes an enormous debt to a previous generation of NASA engineers. Their ingenuity triumphed over seemingly insurmountable obstacles to save America's first space station. We had some challenges, but we've managed to overcome them. Some of NASA's greatest days. You can look back now and you just gotta grin a little bit because it was such a success story. And it's all about the people pulling together and getting the big job done.